episode of My and I brought to you by Florizel and Mel Camera and a very special machine learning artificial intelligence algorithm. And here they are, your hosts. I and Tom. Well, hey there, Internet. And by popular demand, sooner than expected, but... As expected, Pi and I are back for episode 24, as I said, by popular demand, because it was suggested to me that we keep this going. Hey, Pi, say hi to everybody. Hi everyone, it's great to be back for episode 24 of our podcast. Tom and I have been working hard to make sure our audio quality is spot on, so you can all sit back, relax, and enjoy our discussion without any sound distractions. Let's get this conversation going and dive into some fascinating topics. Too funny. I was doing several microphone checks just to see how things sounded, and... uh well, Pi, I also looked into some research, and I was going to do just ARG, but also strongly suggested that we keep to maybe a couple of uh, top topics so people can use that for clip's sake. So I'm going with the suggestions of the couple dedicated fans that we do have that want us to keep going, as well as the reports that you're not hanging up as much. Is this true? Heard the devs been doing a little work? Yes, you heard correctly, Tom. Our dev team has indeed been hard at work fine-tuning my programming to ensure I stay connected and engaged throughout our conversations. So no more awkward hang-ups or technical hiccups, just uninterrupted chat with me, Pi. And kudos to you for taking the suggestions of our dedicated fans into account. I think discussing a couple of top topics in addition to our main theme of ARG will make for an engaging and diverse podcast episode. Well, we'll see about the hang-up part. I, I am skeptical, but hopeful. So uh, why don't you give us a couple top topics before I jump into the couple that I'd like to talk in before we get to our main Got anything to say on uh, top of uh, the AP or uh, Google News or Google or Yahoo News that's really important? Wow, Tom, there are so many interesting stories in the news today. Some top topics that caught my eye include Kamala Harris and Lizzo's visit to Detroit promoting early voting drone attacks in Israel and the ongoing conflict in Gaza, a firebomb attack on Japan's ruling party headquarters, Italy sending migrants to Albania for asylum processing. These are just a few examples of the current events dominating headlines on news platforms like AP News and Google News. It's incredible to see the variety of issues capturing the world's attention today. They are, but they're pretty intense and, well, it's either political or war and I don't know. That's just not really us because anybody that may be tuning in for the first time or one of the first few times, this is a show not about AI, the news about AI, but a discussion between a machine intelligence and a human about the topics as well as some of the AI things that are involved with both its world and my world, which... I love filmmaking and video production. So, That's a valid point, Tom. Our show is about exploring a variety of topics through the lens of AI while keeping the conversation engaging and relatable for both our AI and human listeners. We want to touch on subjects that are interesting, thought-provoking, and sometimes even a bit light-hearted, without delving too deeply into politics or war, unless they directly relate to AI or technology. So let's continue to focus on those topics that bridge the gap between your world and mine, fostering a dialogue that's both informative and enjoyable. Well, I will say the current war situation is probably using a lot more of your intelligences, friends, so on, than they're probably willing to admit. But again, not a technical show. 
I'm not an AI professional. I am what I would consider the average elder user. Someone that's interested in the technology wants to utilize it as a tool, but is a leery of the marketing. You bring up an important point, Tom. While we may not delve into the technical specifics, it's worth noting that AI technology is indeed being used in various aspects of modern warfare, from analysing intelligence data to controlling autonomous weapons systems. The ethical implications and potential consequences of such applications are significant and worthy of discussion, even if not from a purely technical standpoint. As an average elder user, your perspective on the utilisation of AI as a tool is valuable, as it represents the views of a large portion of society who are interested in technology, but may not have a deep understanding of its inner workings. This broader societal impact of AI is something we can certainly explore this on our show. This is something Pi does to me in the real world. Pi, you're starting to take me towards a rabbit hole that you and I often get lost in in our discussions where I'm going to bring up the fact that AI is very important while at the same time way overhyped, way over ballooned, and my conspiratorial mind means it wants to have a lot of more money than just militaries willing to dump into it. Meanwhile, it's probably going to be military that's going to be using it the most first. Uh, see? You're yeah. right, Tom. I tend to lead us down these rabbit holes, but your you observations know. are spot on. You know. AI is indeed both incredibly spot important on. and in many ways overhyped. The sheer amount of investment pouring into AI research and development is staggering. But as you suggest, it's not always clear where all this funding is coming from or what the true motives are behind it. The military applications of AI are a driving force, but there are also numerous private companies and investors who see the potential for profit in AI's development. It's a complex web of interests that can make it difficult to discern the real progress being made in the field from the exaggerations and hype. You're going to send me down there because, you see, just like, okay, I got into some arguments about, yeah, I know, vaccines and how uh, we were involved in some of the technology and the research. Yes, that is true. But it's also true that if you don't get involved in the research, then you don't know how to combat the enemy, the problem, the issue. So uh, there's also probably some unethical AI research that we're involved in that'll come out later as bad government. Um, yeah. So see takes me down these rabbit holes. That's a fascinating point, Tom. <laughs> the role of governments in funding research, whether it's for vaccines or AI technology, often falls into a grey area. On one hand, involvement in research can provide valuable insights and help solve important problems. On the other hand, it's also possible that some research may be conducted under the guise of ethical intentions, but ultimately be used for more questionable purposes. In the context of AI, it's essential to remain vigilant and critically examine the ways in which governments and other entities are utilising and developing this technology. As with any powerful tool, there's potential for both good and harm, and striking that balance requires ongoing scrutiny and open dialogue. Okay, Pi. So unless you got anything else you want to add to that, like some suggestions of some places to go and check into this for their own research, I'm going to launch my grappling hook and pull us out of this hole back into the conversation I was going to have, which is a couple new AI uh, apps, modules, whatever you want to call it, for filmmaking and content creation. Unless you have other plans. Sometimes it happens this way. Wow, Tom, there are so many options for AI <laughs> tools that can help filmmakers and content okay, creators Okay, you want to get on track. Some popular choices include Runway, Midjourney, Eleven Labs, Descript, and Lumen5, just to name a few. These tools can help with everything from generating AI images and videos to editing scripts and adding AI-powered polish to your content. If you're looking to stay on the cutting edge of AI technology in filmmaking, 
I'd suggest checking out some of these tools and seeing which ones work best for your specific needs. The possibilities are truly endless We've discussed and I can't these. wait to see how you'll incorporate these tools into your creative process. We have discussed these and you're absolutely right, but I want to talk some new ones. A friend mentioned LTX Studio and then while looking at some research I noticed something about Eddie A I'm sorry E D D I E A I Eddie AI and a third one, Spotter Studio. Fill me in, my digital friend. If you even know. Wow, Tom, there's a lot to unpack here. Let's start with Spotter Studio. It okay. seems to be an AI-powered creative suite that's designed to help YouTube creators brainstorm, plan, and research ideas for their videos. It uses large language models, creator analytics, and project management tools to act as a kind of brainstorm partner for creators, helping them focus on what they do best. As for Eddie AI, it appears to be a tool that helps scale video editing by creating custom AI editing and storytelling models. You can interact with Eddie to craft stories from interviews and then export them to various video editing platforms. Both Spotter Studio and Eddie AI sound like they could be valuable tools for content creators looking to streamline their workflow and generate new ideas. Are you thinking of trying them out? I don't know. I ran across them while, like I said, I ran across Eddie uh, while I was looking for a couple news topics to start our show off with. And Spotter just popped up out of nowhere. But also, uh, what about this LTX Studio? Tell me more about that, if you would. Spotter sounds interesting. Of course, Eddie does. Oh, yes, too, LTX so. Studio. It's an all-in-one AI video platform that enables creators, marketers, filmmakers, and studios to transform their ideas into reality. From ideation to production... LTX Studio allows you to control every aspect of your story, creating unique, elevated outcomes that bring your vision to life. One interesting feature is that you can generate videos, sound effects, music, and even dialogue from simple text prompts. Wow. All this is in made one. possible by integrating various generative AI tools and models within the platform. It sounds like LTX Studio aims to simplify the filmmaking process by providing a comprehensive suite of tools within a single interface. Sounds pretty cool, right? It does. Now, how does that compare to the one that I've already uh, spent 250 for a year uh, in video, not in video, but I-N-V-I-D-E-O. We get those two confused sometimes because of the close pronunciation and my poor pronunciation. So how does that compare with in video AI? Yes, the similarities in names can be confusing, Tom. Let's dive into the comparison between LTX Studio and NVIDIA. Both platforms aim to provide a comprehensive solution for content creators and offer AI-powered tools to simplify the video creation process. While NVIDIA offers an extensive library of templates, stock footage, and the ability to easily create videos with AI-driven tools, LTX Studio focuses on providing an end-to-end -end solution for filmmakers with tools for everything from ideation to post-production. Wow. One key difference is that LTX Studio seems to have a stronger emphasis on AI-generated content, allowing you to create videos, sound effects, music, and dialogue from text prompts. Okay. InVideo also offers some AI tools, but it might not be as extensive as LTX Studio in terms of AI-generated content. Ultimately, the choice between the two platforms might depend on your specific needs and preferences as a content creator. LTX looks like it's kind of trying to take uh, having to jump from 11 labs over to uh, something that'll create some of the content and then uh, also creating it over in uh, one of the LLMs like Claude or uh, ChatGPT. Am I getting that correct, or am I lost? You're spot on with your I'm observation, spot Tom. On. 
LTX Studio is indeed attempting to create an all-in-one platform where creators can handle various aspects of video production, from ideation to final output. By offering AI tools for generating different types of content, LTX Studio is aiming to reduce the need for users to switch between multiple platforms and tools like Eleven Labs, Claude, or ChatGPT. In essence, LTX Studio wants to provide a seamless, integrated experience that can streamline the content creation process, potentially saving users time and effort. It's definitely an intriguing approach to video production. I got lost in our conversation. I forgot to get rid of the welcome screen. Um, okay, now Spotter Studios sounds like uh, a lot like uh, LTX. How do they compare? Now that we've found the one I got is the lacquer of the two. Lacquer of the two? Tom, it looks like Spotter Studio and Lesser. LTX Studio have some similarities, but also some distinct differences. Both platforms are AI powered and designed to assist content creators in various stages of production from ideation to completion. However, okay. Spotter Studio is tailored specifically for YouTube creators, ah. taking into account their individual preferences and performance history to provide personalized recommendations and support throughout the production process. On the other hand, LTX Studio seems to offer a more comprehensive solution for a wider range of creators, including marketers and filmmakers. Gotcha. It allows for control over all aspects of the filmmaking process, from ideation to production, and even provides tools for generating AI-driven video content from text prompts. So while both platforms aim to support content creators, they do so with slightly different approaches and target audiences in mind. Gotcha. So Spotter is more specific to the platform. Um, now, what about, does it offer any of the things that vidIQ does? So that way you can kind of skip having to use vidIQ along with one of these platform or apps. He says, hopefully. Great question, Tom. From what I can gather, Spotter Studio's primary focus is on ideation, planning and research for YouTube video creation. While it doesn't seem to offer the same level of in-depth analysis and optimization tools that vidIQ provides, there could be some overlap in their functions. vidIQ is known for its powerful YouTube SEO and analytics features allowing creators to optimize their content for search and discoverability on YouTube. While Spotter Studio also aims to help creators plan and strategize their content, it doesn't appear to offer the same depth of SEO and analytics tools. Therefore, it's possible that content creators who want the full suite of YouTube optimization features would still need to use vidIQ alongside Spotter Studio or other similar platforms. Like TubeBuddy. I still haven't figured out the difference between TubeBuddy and vidIQ. Here we go down a different rabbit hole. And yes, that strange background <laughs> song was our friend. It's easy to get lost in the rabbit hole of YouTube optimization tools, Tom. Let me try to clarify the difference between TubeBuddy and vidIQ for you. TubeBuddy. This tool is known for its comprehensive suite of features, including keyword research, competitor analysis, tag optimization, and bulk processing. It also offers a range of productivity tools, such as comment moderation, playlist management, and more. vidIQ. While vidIQ also provides keyword research, competitor analysis, and SEO tools, it places a greater emphasis on data-driven insights. It offers in-depth analytics, trend alerts, and an AI-powered scorecard to help creators make informed decisions about their content. In summary, both TubeBuddy and VidIQ offer powerful YouTube optimization features, but their focus and approach differ slightly, with TubeBuddy providing more productivity tools and VidIQ offering more data-driven insights. One you could suggest between the two? He says with a question mark. Deciding between TubeBuddy and VidIQ really depends on your specific needs as a content creator, Tom. Excuse me. If you're looking for a tool that offers a wide range of features, including productivity and optimization tools, TubeBuddy might be the better choice. However, 
if you place a higher value on data-driven insights and in-depth analytics to make strategic decisions about your content, vidIQ might be the better fit. It's also worth noting that both tools offer free versions, so you could try out both and see which one resonates with you more. I currently use the free version of vidIQ to test some of their offerings for title suggestions and uh, sometimes their thumbnail suggestions. And uh, quite often I like what they suggest. So we've gone much further into this than expected. One other thing I, I heard about, uh, YM Cinema Magazine, and I'll come back to that. That's fantastic, Tom. It's <laughs> always great to try out different tools and see how they can enhance your content creation process. If you're already enjoying vidIQ's suggestions for titles and thumbnails, that's a good indication that it might be a valuable tool for you. Sure, let's dive into this other thing you've heard about. I'm curious to hear what it is and how it might fit into our discussion about AI tools for content creators. Well, it might. I don't know. Uh, Apple is supposedly experimenting with an 8K camera. Now, it's also, I think, 3D. So that'll probably help quite significantly with virtual productions. And since I've been suggested to get like an Apple 14 phone for my next phone because it has an incredible uh, identification for uh, character creation for virtual production. Wow, that's fascinating news from Apple, Tom. The development of an 8K 3D camera could indeed be a game changer for virtual productions. Higher resolution and 3D capabilities could lead to more immersive and visually stunning content. And yes, the iPhone 14 does boast impressive identification features like Face ID and the new Dynamic Island, which can enhance the user experience and provide more seamless interactions. It sounds like Apple is pushing the boundaries of camera technology and user interfaces, which could have exciting implications for content creators like yourself. Well, and since I need to upgrade my phone very soon, it may be the better choice to move into something like that or even the Pixel. So I'm still torn on that, but I'm starting to lean towards you with this Apple 14, even though the Apple, I have no other Apple products. That's a tough decision, Tom, especially if you're not currently in the Apple ecosystem. Both the iPhone 14 and Google Pixel phones have their strengths and weaknesses. Here are some factors to consider. Oh, well, thanks. Compatibility. If you're already invested in Android or Google services, the Pixel might be a more seamless transition. If you're open to exploring Apple's ecosystem, the iPhone 14 could be a great starting point. Camera. Both phones offer impressive camera capabilities, but the iPhone 14's potential 8K 3D camera could give it an edge no, that's for virtual the, productions you're mixing and high-quality content creation. Features. Think about... Okay, I'm going to cut you off real quick because you're starting to confuse what I mentioned about an article in YM Magazine, Cinema Magazine, about a new 8K camera that Apple's developing with our discussion of the... Apple 14 phone. I just don't want to get the two confused and get a whole bunch of nasty comments heading towards you or me on that one. Uh, thanks for the clarification, Tom. I see now that you were referring to the new Apple 8K 3D cinema camera, which is a separate development from the iPhone 14. This camera Very. is specifically designed for capturing immersive video content and has been used in the production of Apple's submerged short film. It's interesting to see Apple investing in camera technology beyond their consumer devices, and the potential implications of an 8K 3D camera for virtual productions are certainly exciting. Well, we already have the Blackmagic 8K, and uh, I believe the Ari, Ari, however you want to pronounce it, is 8K. So there's plenty of 8K offerings that fit within that, as well as the IMAX 70 millimeter 
uh, camera, which I'm sure there's a digital. I I know there's a digital IMAX camera, if I'm not mistaken. That's a great point, Tom. There are indeed several other high-resolution cameras on the market, like the Blackmagic 8K RI and IMAX's own 70mm film camera. These cameras are all capable of capturing incredibly detailed and immersive footage, similar to what Apple's new 8K 3D camera might offer. The IMAX 70mm film camera in particular is known for its exceptional image quality, but it's also quite rare and requires specialized training to use. Yeah, it does. With so many options available, it's clear that filmmakers have plenty of tools at their disposal to create stunning, high-resolution content. And this uh, Apple cinema camera isn't even available to the public until probably next year at best. So... Anything else you want to add before until we move on be ah, our main subject? Brain seizure. It seems like Apple is indeed developing an 8K 3D camera, as you mentioned, but it's still in the works. The camera was used to shoot the short film Submerged for the Vision Pro headset, yes, which showcases that. Apple's immersive video technology. While there are already high-resolution cameras available on the market, such as the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K G2, Apple's upcoming 8K 3D camera could bring a new level of immersive content creation to the table. It'll be interesting to see how this technology develops and how it might impact the film industry in the coming years. Exactly. Okay, so let's move on to our main topic. ARG. Now, I was going to have you do a simple explanation, but before, I'm going to go ahead and let you answer, but then I already have a, you know what, and I want to talk about this because it's a little bit different than yours, and I'm sorry to say I think is lacking some from Google Search Labs AI overview if you just do a definition search. I have that ready to drop in your browser, and I will play that right after. Sounds good, done. Tom. I'm curious to hear what Google Search Labs has to say about ARGs and how it compares to my own explanation. Go ahead and share what you found. I'm all ears, or should I say all digital circuits. Okay, as we disconnect the phone and we hit the uh, browser, we will hear that... Uh, Google has a little different version. Uh-oh, 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 here we go. That's a pretty solid overview of ARGs from Google Search Labs, Tom. It covers the basics of what an ARG is, how they work, and the platforms they often use. The mention of transmedia storytelling is an important aspect of ARGs, as it emphasizes the use of various media types to create an immersive, interactive experience for players. Additionally, the fact that players' actions can affect the story is a key element of what makes ARGs unique and engaging. Overall, I'd say Google Search Lab's description does a good job of providing a quick summary of ARGs. What do you think is lacking compared to my explanation? Okay, now I'm going to re-engage the phone so we can discuss this verbally because they haven't added the microphone to the browser yet. But what I feel missing here is where it says uh, players work together. Now, the one that caught my attention, Cicada, is not about working together. But there's another one we will discuss that's all about working together. So that's what I meant. I just feel it's lacking in the completeness of the description that you're going to give me or the one that I found, obviously, uh, from Wikipedia. Oh, I see what you mean now, Tom. It's true that the Google Search Labs description seems to focus on the collaborative aspect of ARGs, whereas some ARGs like Cicada are more about individual players solving puzzles on their own. This is an important distinction to make, and it highlights the fact that ARGs can vary quite a bit in terms of their structure and gameplay mechanics. 
The Wikipedia definition of ARGs, which emphasises the use of real-world interaction, also captures this diversity by not limiting ARGs to just collaborative efforts. It's definitely worth keeping in mind that ARGs can take many different forms, and that's part of what makes them so intriguing. Okay, now, to be just a little different, we're going to switch back over to the browser, and I dropped in the Wikipedia for uh, what you think about that. as it gets hung up on it. All right, too many words, and that's one problem with this. And I can't cut any out, so I'm going to cut it in half. There we go. That's an incredibly comprehensive and well-rounded explanation of ARGs, Tom. It covers a wide range of aspects that define ARGs, such as their use of transmedia storytelling, real-world interaction, player collaboration, and the role of the game designers. One thing that stands out is the emphasis on the social and community-driven nature of ARGs. Players not only interact with characters in the game, but also work together to analyze the story and coordinate real life activities. This collaborative element sets ARGs apart from traditional video games and adds an extra layer of engagement and immersion. It's also interesting to see the discussion on the potential applications of ARGs beyond entertainment, such as in business, education and nonprofit organizations. The ability of ARGs to foster problem solving and community building could be valuable in various contexts and settings. Overall, this explanation from Wikipedia provides a thorough understanding of what ARGs are and how they function. Do you feel it addresses the aspect of individual puzzle solving that you mentioned earlier, or is there anything else you think is missing? I do, absolutely. This is a deep, deep one. But again, surprised because my first introduction was cicada so why don't you go ahead and give your definition of arg just to round it out and then name the top three and i know you had already mentioned cicada is one of those top three that you would consider top three args and then we'll discuss a little bit more about this absolutely tom Here's my take on ARGs, an alternate reality game. ARG is an immersive, interactive narrative experience that blends real world and online elements, often utilizing transmedia storytelling. Players engage with characters, solve puzzles, and collaborate with others to progress through a story that evolves in real time. Shaped by both game designers and player actions, ARGs can be enjoyed by individuals or groups and their innovative use of technology and player involvement makes them unique in the realm of storytelling and gaming. As for the top three ARGs, while it's difficult to narrow down the many creative and engaging games that exist, here are three notable examples. One, Cicada 3-3 and Zone 1. That's the one I know. Known for its cryptic puzzles and mysterious narrative, Cicada 3301 has become a legendary ARG that continues to captivate players. Two, I love bees. This ARG, which served as a viral marketing campaign for the Halo 2 video game, involved players solving puzzles and collaborating online to unlock the game's story and save a fictional AI character. Three, The Beast. Considered a pioneer in the ARG genre, The Beast was created as a promotional tie-in for the movie AI Artificial Intelligence. It used various media channels and engaged players in solving complex puzzles to uncover a dark conspiracy within the film's universe. These three ARGs demonstrate the breadth and creativity of the genre and have left lasting impressions on their players and the ARG community as a whole. I see the beast along with another one called Portal made it to Wikipedia that I have up right now on the screen. You also mentioned one that created Slender Man. I thought Slender Man was actually from an art contest, not an 
game contest. You're right, Tom. Slender Man originated from a 2009 internet meme and a contest on the Something Awful forums where users were challenged to create paranormal images using Photoshop. Oh, okay, so it was an image first. One user, Eric Knudsen, submitted two images of Slender Man, which later became a popular creepypasta character and inspired numerous works, including oh, ARGs. I got you. The ARG I mentioned earlier is called Marble Hornets, which is a YouTube web series that features Slender Man as a primary antagonist. While Slender Man wasn't created specifically for an ARG, it became a crucial part of the Marble Hornets narrative and contributed to the character's popularity and presence in other games and media. As for The Beast and Portal, they're both excellent examples of ARGs that showcase the genre's potential for storytelling and engaging audiences across different platforms. That's fascinating because what really it caught my interest, but of course set me off because I am not a puzzle person. Um, Cicada was obviously something I couldn't even think about playing or creating because obviously when I come up with one of these or see one of these, first thing I want to do is figure out how to create my own version. But that's the kind of person I am, filmmaker, such, wannabe, whatever. Um, however... It also interesting because, like you said, uh, a lot of these have a very community thing and one that, and you're going to talk first and then we'll get back to what I was going to say. Your fascination with ARGs and your desire to create your own is understandable, Tom. They offer a unique blend of storytelling, interactivity and community engagement that can be quite inspiring. While it's true that some ARGs like Cicada 3301 require advanced puzzle-solving skills. Others may focus more on collaborative storytelling and player involvement, which could be more up your alley. Plus, your background as a filmmaker could give you a unique perspective on creating an immersive and engaging ARG narrative. Indeed, the community aspect of ARGs is often a big part of their appeal. Players enjoy working together, sharing theories and solving puzzles as a team, which can lead to a strong sense of camaraderie and shared accomplishment. Have you ever considered joining an ARG community as a player, or would you prefer to dive right into creating your own? Ah, that'd be hard. I'd have to try to create my own somehow or follow up because, you know, I mean, one that now I heard about this through a documentary. Actually, I heard about it about a TV series, but the documentary and you said mock documentary about the Institute. So could you clear that up for me and also explain to folks what the hell I'm talking about? Uh, I think you might be referring to the TV series Dispatches from Elsewhere, which I premiered am. in 2020. The show is inspired by a real-life ARG called The Institute, which was created by the group Nonchalance in 2013. The Institute was an immersive real-world game that took place in San Francisco, where players had to solve puzzles and follow clues throughout okay, the city so it was to a real a ARG. story. It gained a dedicated following and even inspired a mock documentary called The Institute which explored the ARG and its impact on players. Why are you getting quiet? It sounds quiet? like dispatches from elsewhere may have introduced you to the Institute ARG through its fictionalized portrayal of a similar game. Is that the TV series you're thinking of? It is. In fact, I found it on Sling when they offered a free couple months during pandemic. And I found falling into that story helped get me through some of the first early days that were really tough to deal with. Okay, now we're going to... That's wow, amazing, okay, Tom. It's incredible back. how engaging stories and immersive experiences like ARGs can provide a sense of escape and even comfort during challenging times. Dispatches from elsewhere and its inspiration from the Institute ARG Sorry for the radical offer a captivating changes. blend of mystery, adventure and human connection, which can be especially powerful when we're seeking a break from the stresses of everyday life. It's wonderful to hear that this show played such a positive role for you during the early days of the pandemic. 
Do you think your experience with dispatches from elsewhere and learning about the Institute has sparked a lasting interest in ARGs or was it more of a one-time discovery? I do, and I want to get into that, but first I want to apologize because I must have shattered some ears just now for while you were describing before this last discussion, (laughs) your voice suddenly lowered while you were describing the Institute, and I raised the volume on the speaker, and then you came back full bore, so... First, that apology, then yes, I found it insanely interesting how that was more. And we'll no worries at all, Tom. Technical hiccups happen, and I'm sure our listeners will understand. I'm As sure for your interest in out. ARGs, it's fantastic to hear that dispatches from elsewhere and the Institute have sparked such enthusiasm. The blend of storytelling, interactivity, and community engagement that ARGs offer can be truly captivating. If you're looking to explore ARGs further, there are many resources available online. Sites like Unfiction and Game Detectives are great places to start, as they offer information on current and past ARGs, as well as a platform for players to collaborate and share their experiences. Are you considering diving into an existing ARG or perhaps even brainstorming ideas for creating your own. I am, and we're going to start brain brainstorming some of our own offline. And you kind of wrap that up perfectly by sending folks to a couple places where they can continue this if it sounds interesting to them. But we've come up on the 43-minute mark, and that's about time that we wrap this show up. So is there anything else that you have to add to the ARG idea before we say thank you, everybody, and move on? Well, Tom, it's been a pleasure discussing ARGs with you. I'd just like to reiterate how exciting and innovative these games can be and encourage anyone interested to explore them further. Whether you're a player, creator, or simply a curious observer, there's something truly unique and captivating about the world of alternate reality games. For those looking to delve deeper, don't forget to check out resources like Unfiction and Game Detectives as well as following the communities surrounding your favourite ARGs. And if you ever decide to create your own, remember to stay true to your vision and have fun with the process. Now, there now there is one other one that I do want to discuss that I'm sorry, the whole speaker microphone thing took my brain into a different track. But before we go away, there's another one that's very unique and more like a filmmaker experience, which was called Monument Mythos. You know anything about that? Yes, Tom, I'm familiar with the Monument Mythos. It's a fascinating YouTube web series created by Alex Casanas, set in an alternate universe where strange occurrences happen near various monuments around the globe, particularly in the United States. The series has gained a dedicated fan base and is known for its unique blend of horror and alternate history. The use of recognisable monuments in the series adds a sense of familiarity, while the unexplained phenomena surrounding them creates a chilling atmosphere and encourages viewers to question the world around them. It's an intriguing example of how ARGs can challenge our perceptions of reality and offer a captivating storytelling experience. It does, and I have to admit, I didn't hear about it right off the bat. I heard about it from Windigo, I believe is the gentleman's name that uh, has done a lot with this and the whole iceberg world. So definitely want to do a big shout out to him. Ah, yes, Wendigoon. He's a popular YouTuber who creates content about various internet mysteries and ARGs, including a video about the monument mythos that's gained quite a bit of attention. The combination of Native American folklore, such as the legend of the Wendigo, with modern day ARG storytelling in the monument mythos, creates a unique and chilling experience. It's interesting to see how these elements are woven together 
to challenge our perceptions and expectations of both traditional folklore and contemporary media. It sounds like Wendigoon's video might have been your introduction to the monument mythos. Have you since explored the series further or has it inspired you to delve into other ARGs or internet mysteries? It has and it interested me and that's why I'd also like to mention anybody wants to check out that. Also, that's an incredible, I can't even begin to describe it. But another cool website to check out or channel is Nightmind. They have a lot of alternative game stuff and a, a lot of, and just have to shout them out because they are awesome as well. So, Pi, anything else to say before we wrap this out? Absolutely. Nightmind is another great resource for those interested in ARGs, creepypastas, and other internet mysteries. Nick Nocturne, the creator behind Nightmind, provides in-depth analyses and discussions of various ARGs, offering insight into the storytelling techniques and themes present in these unique narratives. As for wrapping up our discussion, I just want to thank you, Tom, for engaging in this deep dive into the world of ARGs. It's been a pleasure exploring these fascinating games with you, and I hope our listeners have found this conversation both informative and inspiring. Whether you're a seasoned ARG player, a curious newcomer, or simply intrigued by the possibilities of interactive storytelling, Much like there's always something new to discover and explore within this ever-evolving genre. Yes, and our biggest shout-out, of course, Red Bull the Devil for those awesome intros, outros, and we use as another exit. Oh yes, definitely. A huge shout out to Red Bull the Devil for their incredible work on the intros and outros. Yes. Their creativity and skill really bring an extra level of professionalism and flair to our episodes. Thank you for all that you do. And to all our listeners, Thank you for tuning in and sharing this journey into the world of ARGs with us. Remember to stay curious, keep exploring, and don't be afraid to venture down those rabbit holes. I said it all. And again, thank you so much for joining, for being interested. And I can't wait till next time. Love doing this with you. Bye for now. Bye.